Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I uh, see you're busy eating, so I'm not going to ask you a bunch of questions, but I will tell you this is an open presentation. Feel free to get my attention at any time, or um, I have a space at the end of the presentation to answer questions for you. Today we're going to talk about the drinking water system the city of Houston maintains and operates. Uh, got a few really high level slides to share with you today and um, I, I can do probably a whole day seminar on most of these slides so feel free like I said to stop me and ask questions. City of Houston has a service area that is more than just inside the city limits which is about 325 square miles. Inside the city limits, that's 2.1 million people, give or take, which um, population uh, projection you want to follow. However, we are also a regional provider for Harris County, parts of Fort Bend County, part of Montgomery County, and um, Brazoria County. So that's almost 5 million people that we provide water to. Water supply from the city of Houston in addition to groundwater, and I'll get back to that, uh, we have three surface water supplies. We have Lake Livingston, and the city has about 70% share of the water rights in Lake Livingston. Uh, we have Lake Conroe, and the city has two-thirds of the water rights available currently in Lake Conroe. And then we have Lake Houston, uh, and we have 100% of the water rights in Lake Houston. However, if you look at the pie chart on the top left, you'll see that the majority of our water comes from Lake Livingston. And that's because we transport that down the Trinity River and over to an area near Baytown where it is uh, sent through large diameter lines to our east water plant and our southeast water plant. The only plant that treats 100% Lake Houston water is our plant, the northeast plant, which is right off of the Beltway. However, that's going to change, and I'll get back to that later. By source, you can see Again, Livingston is the biggest part of our source, but groundwater is 20% of the water we deliver. If you live in the Kingwood area or around Lake Houston, you are drinking groundwater. You are not drinking Lake Houston water. We do not have transmission lines from our surface water plants to Kingwood yet. The delivery system and the treatment system. Um, I forgot my pointer, so I'm so sorry, but let's see if I can use the arrow. This is the northeast plant, the one I told you that is off the Beltway near Lake Houston. It is 80 million gallons a day uh, capacity. And then you have the east plant here on, um, off of Federal Road. That's 362 million gallons a day. And then we have a plant down here. At, it's also near the Beltway, uh, near Ellington Field. And that's 200 million gallons a day. So that's where we treat all the surface water, water from the lakes and the rivers. You can also see we have 59 pump stations. Most of those pump stations are purely groundwater, but seven of them have a combination of groundwater and then repressurized surface water. And the rest of these bullets you can easily see. There's over 75. No. <laughs> There's over, um, let's see if we can go back. 7,500 miles of water lines. That includes our large diameter transmission lines and small lines inside your neighborhoods. So we're talking everything from 108 inch diameter to a two inch diameter. Over almost 60,000 fire hydrants, over 100,000 valves, a nationally accredited laboratory where we run the samples, 130 groundwater wells, and almost 160 tanks or towers. This entire system is operated by staff of about 650 people in my organization. And we have everything from people with GEDs to PhDs as part of this organization. We have accountants in the, in the group that I manage. We have, of course, uh, scientists. We have engineers. We have operators. We have maintenance people. It is open for anyone that wants to be a part of the drinking water system. So in addition to the population we serve, we also have contracts, and these are very large water supply contracts. We have treated water contracts, um, and that's to other small municipalities, something like a West University or a Bel Air, 
Um, they're, they're pretty much swallowed or surrounded by the city of Houston, and so we supply the water to them. You'll see this says GRP, that's Groundwater Reduction Plan Contracts. That's people that want to pump groundwater, but has to be accounted for, and I'll get to that later, in our subsidence plan. And so we offset the groundwater that they pump with surface water. We also sell raw water or untreated water. And these are actually two different things. The raw water is water probably straight from the lake or from the river, and it goes to a lot of the companies you'll see on the ship channel. Also, uh, the municipality of Deer Park buys raw water and has their own treatment organization. Untreated water is actually our reuse water, which means it's discharged from the wastewater plants. Um, and then strategic partners, these are people that actually, in addition to buying the water, help contribute capital to build some of the large facilities and expansions. And I've got a bit more on that in a moment. One of the reasons that we have um, taken on this role as a regional provider is because of subsidence. And subsidence is essentially um, the soils that we have here are, are clay, and as you pull more groundwater out, they collapse, and the ground elevation actually um, goes down. So we have two main subsidence districts that we work with, Harris-Galveston, and uh, this map will show you they've essentially chopped Harris and Galveston County in thirds. Um, and the next area to convert would be this northwest corner. By 2025, 60% of the water they provide has to be surface water, and the other 40% can be groundwater. Well, as I showed in a previous slide, the city of Houston has most other surface water rights in the area, thus we've taken on the role as a regional provider. Uh, the other subsidence district we deal with is Fort Bend subsidence district, and that's, they've got an area A that also has a reduction target of 60% surface water provided. Um, we'll go to the next slide, because I can talk all day about that one. TWDB, Texas Water Development Board, it is a state agency that manages the funding of um, large water projects and even small rural water projects. They have population estimates and each region in the state, Houston is part of Region H, has to submit a plan on how they're going to provide water to that region you know, in, the, in the out years. So TWDB has a, within the city limits, thinks by 2060 there'll be almost uh, 3 million 400 people in the city limits. So Sidon's district has their own projections, and they're a little bit lower. I think there are only going to be about three million. However, in the service area, and that's outside the city limits, but in those other counties, um, TWDB thinks there's almost going to be seven million people. And so Sidon's district says, you know, a little over six million. Well, we have to calculate something called gallons per capita per person per day, G gallons per person per capita per day, GPCD. And that's how you convert population to a demand. And you can see that we're here in um, 2016, and an average day is about 509 million gallons per day. Our peak to date, oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that one more time? The GPCD or yes. gallons per person per capita per day. So, okay. <laughs> and that is essentially a, a measurement. Simplified, it takes the total volume of water we produce, surface water and groundwater, and divide it by the total population. That's simplified. However, if you go back to the chart I showed earlier that uh, accounts for all those contracts, if you re remove all the water we sell, I think an average GPCD is about 150 gallons. We have gotten in the city of Houston because of the, the density, population density, and more multifamily homes down to about 70 million gallons per person per day. Now, the most that the water system has ever delivered was during the drought of 2011, and that was 671 million gallons on one day. And so these projections are saying that the average day by 2040 is going to be you know, about 860 million gallons average with a peak over 
1.2 billion gallons in any particular day. I will be long retired. You will be standing up here giving this talk, and I'll make sure that um, I attend. How are we going to get from where we are right now to this future demand, meeting the subsidence rules and meeting you know, these population growths? And I'll talk a little bit about a few of these projects. The first one, um, I'm not sure if you've heard about, it's called Loose Bayou Inner Basin Transfer. Earlier I showed you a chart where we have all these water rights and volume available in Lake Livingston. However, the only way I can get it into the city right now takes it into the east and southeast side of town. I can't get it to the northwest where they're having a mandate to get off of surface water. So we are building a pipeline and a canal from Trinity River to Lake Houston to transfer eventually about 500 million gallons a day into Lake Houston. Then we've got to add, build capacity to treat that water. So the first phase, we're going to add 320 million gallon per day capacity to the northeast plant, the one that's right off of the beltway. Also, the long-term plan requires us to have reuse as part of our supply strategy. So the city has already permitted over 500 million gallons a day of return flows. This is effluent from our wastewater plants. However, in order to maintain flows into Galveston Bay, we've committed in our permits to the regulatory agency, Texas Commission of Environmental Science, that 50% of our permanent capacity will always be available to go into Galveston Bay. And then the city also has water rights in the Brazos River Basin uh, uh, facility called Allen's Creek Reservoir. And then long term, out to the 2060, uh, DSAL is part of our portfolio. The Loose Bayou project that I mentioned, again, it's moving water from Trinity River to Lake Houston, 26 miles of pipes and, can and canals. This project is going to cost the city of Houston and our partners about $350 million just to move the water. Then to build that plan expansion that I mentioned, right now the project is budgeted at $1.6 billion. Still has to get out the plant to those areas. Transmission lines, about 12 miles of transmission line, 108 inch diameter, $445 million. We're about $2 billion, a little over $2 billion right now. And that just gets the water from the Trinity River to a meter for these regional customers. They then have to build lines beyond the meter and in a distribution. So to meet the subsidence target for 2024, we're talking about these entities spending about well over $3 billion just to deliver water. And the 12 miles, um, the pipeline, it's hard to see here. The purple line is actually in existence. It's 84, goes down to 66. And then there's a red line here that super, they, it's hard to see. That's the 102 inch, and then it'll go down to 84 inches. And that's just the one we're participating in. We have other customers building other large lines to transport water. So that is really quick, really high level, where the water's at and who's using it and how we have to move it. Do you have any questions on that part? Because now I'm going to get into the water quality side. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> the water you drink from the tap is governed by the Safe Drinking Water Act. The reason I say that is a lot of people drink bottled water thinking it's safer. Bottled water is treated to completely different standards and they're much lower. And they're treated, uh, their standards are by the, the FDA, like Food and Drug Administration. So they don't have to sample and do the things that I have to do to ensure the water is safe. Look it up. <laughs> anyway, Safe Drinking Water Act um, was last amended in 2002. And this is a congressional act that gives the EPA the authority to establish water quality regulations. EPA cannot talk to every water provider. So they give the responsibility to enforce these laws to many states. But if they find that a state is not enforcing these rules, the EPA can take the authority back. For the state of Texas, I'll get back to Texas, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act has 
what we call primary and secondary um, water quality standards. We can talk about disinfection. Um, that's where we add chlorine and ammonia. Disinfection byproducts means that the level I add has to, can only be to a certain amount because it, it can react with the organics already in the water and create um, byproducts that are also hazardous. Um, inorganic chemicals, microorganisms, organic chemicals, and radionuclides. Lots of details behind these high level numbers. The secondary standards are things like taste, color, odor. And um, they're standards, but you, we don't get um, violations if you don't like the way your water smells. In Texas, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality has gotten the authority from EPA to enforce the Safe Drinking Water Act. They determine where we sample the water, when we sample. They select outside contractors to duplicate what we do, and an outside laboratory, um, Texas Department of State Health Services, to do separate analysis. So even though the city has an on-site nationally certified lab, the state verifies what we do so that you're sure when you get water out the tap that it, it meets these safe drinking water standards. In addition, they come and spend about four weeks with my staff and do a comprehensive um, assessment for compliance with every part of the, um, this is Texas Administrative Code, TAC, so it's 30 TAC 290. 290 are the drinking water rules for the state of Texas. In addition, we turn in monthly reports from all of our surface water plants. Um, we turn in almost daily reports on sampling activity in our system. And then if I want to change chemicals inside the plant, I have to get the TCEQ's approval to change chemicals and the treatment standards. Well, how do you treat surface water? The process we're currently using is called conventional treatment. Essentially, coagulation, flocculation. So if you've seen Lake Houston and you see it's kind of murky, it looks that way when it comes into the plant. The science says that bacteria and viruses will attach to those part particles. Those, those, um, and so we add chemicals to make them coagulate, stick together, and then settle out of the system. And that's how we remove it, primarily through the sedimentation basin. And then once you get most of the particles out, then you go through multi-layer filters. These filters can have everything from um, sand to anthracite to, um, uh, I can't think of the other aggregate we use right now. And then once it's filtered, we disinfect it. And that's where you add, um, for a groundwater system, like in St. Kingwood, you just add chlorine. For a surface water plant, you add chlorine and ammonia. Um, and again, people that work in the plants, people that collect the samples, all have to have TCEQ license. And so they take series of classes and tests administered by the state in order to be licensed to work with the, in the system. talk a little bit about the lab. Our lab does, I want to say, about 14,000 analysis a month. So that one sample they collect may do 10 to 15 analysis on it for metals or bacteria or E. coli. Um, when the TCQ comes and collects samples, we duplicate what they do. They also do analysis of in-process samples to make sure we're on target with the treatment standards that we have in place. If you've ever called 311 and said, my water tastes funny, my water has a funny color, um, I don't like the way it smells, people on my staff will come. Now, a city of Houston person will never come inside your house. So they will collect a sample at a hydrant closest to your house, and they, they will ask to come on your property and collect a, si a, a sample at a, a spigot outside your house. Um, it is very important you know that city employees do not go inside of your house. Uh, you'll have to call the health department if you want somebody to go inside your house. <laughs> but we investigate every complaint 
And right now we get between five and 600 complaints a month. Out of 2.1 million people, you, you can do the math, it's not that bad, but each and every one of them do get investigated by my staff. And then the total coliform rule is just taking samples at people's homes, outside their homes, to make sure our disinfectant is working in the system and that we're not allowing any kind of bacteria to grow in, in the water system. And those are very tight rules. Now, this is where I expect you to have lots of questions. <laughs> Bless you. There are several topics that are coming up uh, in the news and especially in the Kingwood area and other parts of the city. Water color. My water is brown. I can't drink it. Well, I can't tell you I would drink it either, but I can tell you it's safe to drink if it came through the city system. This is naturally occurring particles, or magnesium, iron, from the well, especially in Kingwood. And the operator of the water system up here adds a, um, a phosphate to get that color particle to either stay in suspension or to um, plate out into the pipeline. We're finding that the chemicals they're using are not quite as effective as they used to be, so we're working closely with them to get that dosage um, optimized for the Kingwood area. Um, we don't normally have complaints like my water is brown in the surface water system. But in Kingwood, those are usually the most prevalent complaints. And then if the fire department comes and flushes a fire hydrant, they're supposed to flush them twice a year. It changes the velocity in the pipe and can stir up the particles and also cause you know, brown water. Um, if you ever experience this at home, my recommendation is go outside and flush your water from the, from the tap outside until it's clear. If you flush your hot water, it's just going to build up in your hot water heater. If you flush your sink, you're just pulling it into your house. Um, but if you notice it and it's already in your house, then um, you just have to let it run out, unfortunately. White. I got a rash of calls a few weeks ago. My water is white. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I don't know what that means, but OK. <laughs> so I actually had to go to my water quality people. I'm like, what would make water right white? And they're like, it's just air. It's just air in the system. When we have these really cold days and the water is coming up from the wells, and it's a different temperature, the air gets trapped in it until it can um, flush through. And so we'll open up hydrants just to make the water flush through the system. It's not a contaminant. It really is just air if your water is white. Um, I've also got complaints that my water is red, my water is blue, my water is green. Each one of those has their own um, contributing, contributing factors. Lead and copper. I'm sure many of you have heard about what is going on in Flint, Michigan. And I've probably been in more talks and discussions about Flint, Michigan than you would ever want to be. But essentially, um, for those of you that haven't followed this, Flint is one of those towns where the tax base was eroding, and so the governor appointed someone to go in and help them cut costs. By cutting costs, this person changed the source of their water from Detroit to another, <coughs> another entity. And Flint has their own water treatment plant that they had not been using. And so they changed their source, they started up a plant that they hadn't been using, and no one paid attention to their um, corrosion control levels, their pH essentially. Um, and so this water, within weeks of being turned on in this plant, started coming out the tap red, and the, and the citizens were complaining. However, the regulators and, and the operators were not responding appropriately and let it go on too long because there is currently and the EPA is proposing new rules, but there is currently a level of lead that is within the safe drinking water standards. Practically, there is no safe level of lead, but there is no way, unless you want to pay hundreds of dollars for your water bill, for us to put the treatment technology in place to remove all lead possible. And that would only be at the plant. 
the lead that is coming out of your tap, or you may hear about schools with lead in, in water fountains and things like that, it's due to the fixtures. There's lead in, um, there was a time when you can lead solder water pipes, so if you have an older home, uh, you may want to get that checked out. I think it's before the 80s. And then recently they reduced the level of lead that could be in materials in the wet part of water systems. So um, school systems, elementary schools, high schools that are older may have lead or high lead content in their parts in their water fountains, in parts in their um, kitchen sinks where they prepare food. And so lots of agencies, HISD, ALEAF, um, have been systematically going through each campus and sampling and replacing any materials they find with high lead content. For your service area, the city has done a survey and we have no lead. The, the, in the Northeast, in the Midwest, there are truly lead lines from the main in the street to your house or to your meter. We don't have any of those in Houston. Houston's water system is fairly new compared to a Boston or a Detroit. Um, and so the way we make sure that lead does not leach out of systems inside your house is we maintain a certain pH range. And as long as we stay within that pH range, it should not strip anything out of your house. If you have any questions about lead and copper and where you live, please contact me and my information will be on the last slide. Um, another hot topic we have right now is fluoride. There have been several communities that have lobbied their legislators to stop adding fluoride. I've recently been approached by the Dental Association because the city of Houston hasn't been adding an optimal amount of fluoride in our system. Fluoride can be added through several chemicals. The city of Houston uses a highly hazardous one called hydrofluorosilic acid. It is very corrosive. Um, it eats through our system, it eats through our pumps, it eats through our tanks, and so it's a hard system to operate. Um, in the Kingwood area, I've recently discovered that the operator is adding fluoride to groundwater, which is an anomaly. In groundwater, fluoride can be found as a contaminant, and so TCEQ, EPA say you can't have too much, you, you have to remove it if there's too much fluoride. In surface water, it's not, so um, that's where we add it. Bless you. Okay, this front row has been sneezing. I'm going to stand over here. <laughs> um, and the last chemical or uh, area of interest going on right now in the water system is chrome 6. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen that movie, Erin Brockovich, but this was the contaminant uh, that she had found the paperwork on that that company was um, dumping into the ponds that got into the groundwater system. Is a naturally occurring um, or it can be part of a um, chemical process. EPA does not have a limit for it yet. The state of California has a limit of 10 parts per billion. The city of Houston did sampling several years ago as part of an EPA sampling requirement. And right now we're a little less than, um, we're about 6.6 .6 parts per billion on average. But you may see um, stuff in the media if you follow water quality issues about Chrome 6. So I went really fast about a lot of things. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that. I brought a few, um, what we call the, the drinking water quality reports. I didn't realize until I unpacked them that one is in English and one is in Spanish. So if you want to practice your Spanish, you get one of each and see if you can understand what's in it. Um, but EPA mandates the, the information that's in here. And you should get one, I think about July every year from your, from your um, system now for two, maybe three years now, EPA said we could just send you a flyer in your water bill or post it online and then you can go online and, and get it. So you may not actually get a hard copy anymore, but there's a lot of information in these reports. Um, the city actually operates uh, seven 
water systems, and, and if you get a copy, you can see it. But the big green blob here is the city of Houston main system. And that's the one that has all the surface water plants and most of the groundwater plants. And this map, uh, Kingwood, is this kind of brown blob up here. And then the report is color coded. So if you turn to Kingwood, you'll find the analysis that were done um, for Kingwood in the last 12 months. And then if you just Google Houston water quality reports, it'll take you to a page that has over 10 years of these reports on it. And then if your group wants to do a tour uh, at the Northeast plant, we actually have a waterworks education center. And the, the center was designed with younger children in mind, but it's very educational for everyone if you're interested in water quality. You essentially are a drop of water and you enter like from Lake Houston, you go through a, a big pipe, you go through the treatment process, and then you come out and it just shows you each step that I've described here briefly in purifying the, the surface water. And then it goes on to give you water facts and conservation facts. So some of these flyers are over there as well.